Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Seifert, and uh, I'm a fourth generation farmer. Uh, I operate a small 100 acre family farm uh, in partnership with my dad, just south of uh, Jordan, Minnesota. Um, we have uh, 100 acres total, about 65 acres of cropland, um, and uh, we do a mix of things. So we grow corn and soybeans, we grow alfalfa hay, uh, we usually grow a small grain each year, um, either oats or winter rye. Um, I raise broiler chickens on pasture, and in the spring I make maple syrup. So we are doing quite a few odds and ends on our place. Um, and you're going to learn a little bit more about some of that too as we go along. So. Um, I'm excited to be here today as a farmer mentor for the uh, Soil Health Coalition and um, uh, I also serve on the Soil Health Steering Committee for the Land Stewardship Project and uh, just happen to be the Scott County Chapter President for the Minnesota Farmers Union. So on any given day, much like many of you I'm sure, I wear a lot of different hats and I really enjoy that because um, it gives me a chance to get out and get together with folks like all of you and share information and participate in events. and. We all learn something from each other, and that keeps things fun. Um, so that's a picture of me and my dad. I know it's not super visible, but uh, and our farm is called Ravenview Farm. This is me and my wife, Dana. Uh, Dana works off farm as a physical therapist, but she pitches in on evenings and weekends and anytime we need an extra hand. This is my daughter, Olivia, uh, with the little baby chick there. She loves everything animal related and she's also training up to be the next generation tractor driver on our farm. Um, <laughs> that was just a couple of days ago we took that one. All right, so I think uh, any event like this, it's worthwhile to refresh the soil health principles. Most of you folks have probably seen or heard these before. Um, but uh, just going down the list, number one, you know, know your context, know what your individual farm uh, is and is capable of doing and what you want it to do and what you have available to you versus someone else's place. Um, keep the soil covered uh, with uh, residue if possible. Minimize soil disturbance. Increase diversity, whether that's through cover crops or increased crop rotation or whatever um, uh, best serves that for you. And try to maintain continuous living roots in the soil at any given time. And then the last one is integrate livestock, which uh, like Matt said, you know, that one's a little more optional, but it certainly helps. Um, that's one thing that we're trying to do on our farm, similarly in that um, we're not quite ready for it yet, but we're getting there. Um, so today I want to kind of focus mostly on context uh, because, um, because my farm is fairly small, I'm working with smaller, older equipment, there might be a big difference between the stuff that I have to work with versus what some of you guys have to work with. So I'm going to try to focus on like the, the reasoning behind what we're doing more than the exact specifics um, because hopefully then even though we might have radically different farms you can take an idea away that you can go home and use in your soil health journey. Um, so this is a picture of our farmstead circa about 1960 um, and I like to uh, show this picture uh, it looks quite a bit different now than it did then. We lost our dairy barn in a storm in 1998 and a couple of other outbuildings took some storm damage and a few have just um, fallen down due to the slow march of time. So um, it's not quite like this anymore, but uh, I like to show the picture because it's an example of a fully diversified farm operation. So my grandpa would have been running the farm at this time and he at this time would have been milking about 20 dairy cattle. He was raising hogs. My grandma had a flock of laying hens. She sold eggs or bartered them for groceries. Um, his crop rotation consisted mostly of corn, oats, and alfalfa. You can kind of see that in the picture. There's an oat field behind that uh, graphic that I put up there. Um, and uh, it's a reminder to me that the farm was diversified once, and it can be again. And that's kind of what we're working on as, as our goal now that I'm helping to run the farm. Um, <clears throat> And the other thing too is, despite the fact that we lost our barn and I miss it and it, the farm doesn't look quite right without it, there is something to be said for starting from square one where you're not tied to existing infrastructure and can kind of reinvent yourself, um, not feeling limited by anything. So that's worth something. So um, from 1998, oh, I was gonna go back here quick, just a quick timeline there. The farm was founded in, tw in 1912. It was a diversified farm until 1975. 
Uh, and that year, my grandpa tragically died in a farm accident, and my dad took over the farm. So he focused on dairy farming, and we were a pretty strict dairy farm until 1993. They went through the credit crisis of the 80s and uh, just about lost the place, but managed to hang on to it. And uh, by 93, mom and dad were done with that. So um, dad had been in construction prior to that. He went back into construction and then farmed part-time until 2018, which is when I got into things. So he was growing corn and beans uh, just as a weekend and evening thing, basically, on our little home place. Okay, so um, while dad was doing his part-time farming gig, we did a lot of tillage. I mean, it, it, was, it was pretty standard practice of moldboard plowing corn stalks, chisel plowing the soybean ground, a couple of passes with the field cultivator every spring, um, broadcast fertilizer, um, and not really changing our herbicide modes of action or, or uh, mixing things up too much. Um, and without cattle on the farm, we weren't putting manure back on the fields like we had been. So um, we were losing something over that time period then. And uh, you can see the dust cloud behind the, the cultivator. Familiar picture, I'm sure. And as a result of all that, we started to see some pretty significant erosion on our farm. Um, our fields are not particularly hilly, but it is kind of a rolling topography. So when we'd get a big rain event, everything would concentrate in the lower areas and wash the soil away. And that was alarming. Um, that hadn't really been a problem. Uh, and, and then it became more of a problem as time went on. And we also started to have a problem with herbicide-resistant weeds. So this is in 2019. It was a wet spring, and we couldn't get into plant corn. And what you're seeing there is pretty much all ragweed, a carpet of ragweed in that field. It had just been sprayed. It was dying off, but um, we, we hadn't planted that yet. So uh, those are things that were, uh, were, were alarming to us and we were having a hard time uh, dealing with. And here you could, this is just gives you kind of a general idea, like I said, a little bit rolling topography, but not real steep or hilly. All right, so in 2017, we made the decision to switch to no-till and start using cover crops and, uh, and start working on a more diverse crop rotation. So these are the goals that we set for ourselves. Maybe not all at once, but this is what it evolved into. Uh, switching to no-till, planting hardy cover crops after cash crops, planting green in the spring, uh, interseeding a diverse cover crop mix into our corn, uh, reducing our chemistry and inputs in general, and then focusing on profit, dollars per acre rather than yield. And then I wanted to learn about soil biology and try to get a better handle on what we had going on in our fields at the biological level to try to understand what the changes were that we had and what we could make. So you can see we, <laughs> we still pick corn on the ear. We put it in cribs to dry because we don't have a drying system. Um, gives you, again, a little bit of an idea of the scale that we're at. Um, but I want to talk about the assets that we had to work with. Sorta, kinda. So our, uh, our big tractor is a John Deere 4020. Uh, we have an International 686 as kind of our uh, medium, medium scale piece of equipment tractor. Uh, and then a Farmall M and an Alice Chalmers D14 as our chore tractors and little odds and ends. Uh, we have a John Deere 7000 four row wide planter, uh, John Deere 8300 grain drill, that's 12 feet wide. We picked up a Truax eight foot no-till drill, which I'll talk about going forward. And then uh, for combine, we have a John Deere 4400 with uh, corn and bean heads and a pickup head. Um, Clark 300 gallon sprayer, 25 foot boom. Again, nothing real, nothing real big. Um, new idea corn picker, a Minneapolis Moline sheller. Um, it's like an antique show at our place, actually, but it works for us. Um, and then we have a full line of New Holland hang equipment for making uh, small square bales. So that gives you the background for my place, um, or at least enough to get started here. So I want to start off talking about our corn planter and uh, some of the things we've done with that. And I want to make two points that I feel are important here. And the first one is, if you're going to transition from a tillage system to a no-till system, First and foremost, before you start adding accessories or looking at things you can tack on to your planter or um, uh, things you think you might need, first and foremost, start by tuning that planter up really, really well. Because what we found was that our planter is a, an early John Deere 7000 model and it was pretty well worn out, but it was skating by okay in a tillage system. Once we switched to no-till, we found that any worn out parts, anything that didn't align properly, anything that wasn't set just right, 
made a big difference in the quality of our stand. So starting with basic maintenance, I don't think people talk about that enough, is, is a huge deal. Like you, you will see a big difference in the quality of your stand just by replacing worn out things and getting things tuned up and aligned and set right. Um, probably some of you guys know that, I'm probably not telling you anything new, but it's the best bang for your buck, I think, before you start getting into add-ons and accessories. Um, let's see, what else have I got here? I gotta catch my place again. So anyway, one of the first things we did, our, our planter didn't have any down pressure springs. So the first year that we were gonna do no-till, we went out and bought a set of standard duty down pressure springs. I think they cost me like $35 cash from a guy for each row unit. And that's all we did. We just added that and we went out and we no-tilled our corn into soybean residue. And the planter did kind of a surprisingly acceptable job. But we identified um, a few things that were not right on it that we needed to, to fix. Um, and I think that brings up a, a, an important point that the best modifications are the ones you don't have to do. So, in my opinion, the right system is to go out and try it with the equipment that you've got. See how it does. Observe the results. You know, if you're planting, see what the stand is, what the germination looks like. Figure out what, what's working and what isn't and get a goal in your mind so that when you do decide what you want to do with your equipment, it's in service to that goal and not just, you're not just randomly throwing money at parts or trying to, uh, you know, going out and buying something because you get it in your head. We're all kind of equipment junkies. You get an idea in your head that you want something um, and then you got to feel like you got to go out and get it. But make sure that it's in service to a certain goal. Um, and, uh, and, and manage your risk. So if you're trying something with a piece of equipment that you haven't done before, keep it to a limited number of acres. You know, make sure that if you're, gonna, if you're worried about failure that it's not going to be a big financial impact on you. Um, so for us, we identified uh, a, a few things right off the bat. Um, we figured out that our closing wheel assemblies were really worn out, that we couldn't even align them properly, that uh, the smooth closing wheels on the planter were not closing the seed trench very well. Um, we, what was probably the worst was that our gauge, our, uh, gauge wheel arm assemblies were all worn out and they would spread away from the seed disc openers and let mud in. And that had worked fine under tillage, but once we hit no-till and got into some mud, ugh, it was 2019 was a wet spring and I spent a lot of time cleaning mud out of the planter. And I said, that's it, we gotta get this fixed right away. <laughs> I don't ever wanna do that again. Um, our first year no-tilling, we broadcast our fertilizer because it was what we had been doing under a tillage system. And uh, our agronomist at the co-op had said, you know, just put a stabilizer in it, it'll be fine. We weren't happy with it, so we wanted to ban our fertilizer after that. Um, and uh, so one of the first things we did was we went out and we got new fertilizer coulters. The planter had had them on there, but we wore them out and dad scrapped them <laughs> years before that because we'd been, we'd been tilling in broadcasted fertilizer. So we had to go find a new set of fertilizer coulters. And then to the back end of the planter here, we added um, new, new closing wheel assemblies. So that fixed the problem with aligning everything on the seed trench properly. Um, I bought the upgraded T-handle ones from Shoop because uh, the, the old 7000s had the crank style ones where you had to have a socket with you on the field. Much better. I mean, really appreciate the simplicity of this. Uh, we put a single spike closing wheel on each assembly to help close that seed slot up better. And, um, and you can see maybe, I don't know, the, uh, the gauge wheel arm fixes. That's, whoever came up with that was a genius because that allowed us to shore those gauge, those gauge wheels up and keep them nice and tight to the seed disc openers again. And that's really about all we did, except that we, you know, we went through and made sure seed tube guards were replaced. There were some parts on the planter I, don't, I think my dad didn't even know could be replaced that we replaced. Um, mud scrapers, all that, and then tuned it so everything was lined up and set up just right. And then we went out and planted green with it in the spring of 2020, and we had a much better stand of corn. Um, really established well, it was a good year, um, and I credit part of that success to just having that planter set up just right. Um, they say knee high by the 4th of July. This was June 20th, so I figured we need to update that saying to tickling the moon by the 20th of June. Just workshopping that one if you guys you know, think that might be good or not. Um, 
So, um, I want to kind of emphasize too here that one thing about me that you're going to learn is I'm, I'm allergic to spending money and we have to be on our size operation. So until something has really proven itself, you know, and I know that it's going to work, we'll, we'll cobble things together from anything we have laying around. Um, in 2021, we had a dry spring and our marker arms wouldn't make a decent mark. And of course, we're not on guidance of any kind. So how do we get a better mark in the soil? Well, just uh, put some C-clamps and some old barbell weights on the marker arms and go out and see what happens. And it helped, it did a little better. Um, but the, the lift cylinder on the 7,000 there for the marker arms is pretty weak. So if you put the weights too far out, you couldn't get them, the arms to come back up again. So, <laughs> so we just moved them around until, until it did an okay job. And then the next year we took that lesson, we learned from it. We went out and got some notched marker uh, discs from Shoop and uh, you can see the old one there next to it. And a really simple thing that I had read online somewhere, probably New Ag Talk, was that uh, the 7000s are set up to push the, the dirt away to make the mark. And if you just pivot, set the disc differently and then pivot it the other way, it would pull to make the mark. It made a huge difference. Did a much better job just by changing the geometry. Uh, this was this spring. And uh, we, it's a little tough to see, but much better row mark, which is nice for later on when we're interceding and things like that. We want to do a good quality job planting just like anybody. Um, one other thing from these pictures, just a quick thing, it's not even an equipment thing, but you can see my winter rye in this picture is planted in the same orientation that we're going with the planter. Two years later, same field, I changed it so I'm going at a 45 degree angle. Something dead simple, it just helps us see where our marks are better and it doesn't matter which way the rye is planted, so um, small thing that makes a difference. Okay, uh, final thing I believe with the corn planter here is um, We had in 2021, we tried to plant green into a field of alfalfa that we had terminated that spring. And it was a bad combination of factors where it was dry. Um, we should have terminated the crop in the fall probably so it didn't have a chance to really break down or mellow out at all. Um, and, the, and the standard duty down pressure springs on the planter just didn't get it in the ground. So we ended up having to do a tillage pass on that alfalfa to get the corn planted. And that all worked out, but we were trying to avoid that. So we went with some heavy duty down pressure springs um, they're a little hard to see. I picked them up used um, from, a, again, a guy on Craigslist probably. I get a lot of my parts on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Um, and that's a nice insurance policy, but it's also a little bit of a cautionary tale, which is if you've got the ability to put a lot of down pressure down, it doesn't mean you have to use it all. <laughs> I learned that this spring. So setting those things, whether it's your hydraulic or air down pressure or springs like I have, Set them so that you have just enough to get the job done uh, and not too much. Because when, when we planted this spring, it was a little wet and I had some em emergence problems with corn in the low areas. And what I think the deal was, it's just a theory right now, is that I had those down pressure springs set too tight and I compacted the sidewall of the seed trench and those, the corn plants are just having a hard time um, getting their roots established and getting to the nutrients that are banded right next door. So, that's my best working theory, although Jerry, you made me think maybe drag chains would be a good thing too. So, because <laughs> we got hot and dry and the seed slot might have opened up. So, I'll have to look into that a little bit more. So, I mentioned before that uh, uh, we had broadcast our fertilizer and we wanted to band it. Uh, but the issue was, we were using enough fertilizer and um, that, that we couldn't get it all on in one pass with the planter. And we didn't have a way to side dress anything. And, but we, we wanted to do a split application or we had to do a split application. So I came up with the idea that we'll just take the row units off the planter and then in early June, you know, go up, fill up the fertilizer boxes and run out and side dress the crop. Just pin the marker arms up and go to town. And that worked amazingly well for something that took us, you know, two hours to prep for and then go out and do it. And we were able to side dress our corn, had a fantastic crop, um, worked great. We've since reduced our fertilizer rates a bit more and, uh, and we can get it all on in one shot. So now we're not doing this because it saves us a trip. But if I had to, I'd go right back to it again. Just another shot of that, going out side dressing dry fertilizer. 
All right, that's kind of it for planters, from my experience. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm going to move on to drills, but we can take a second. Otherwise, we can take them at the end, too. Okay, I'll just move on. I'm going to be around, so you can always ask me. Um, so when we started down the path to soil health practices, Dad and I felt like we needed to pick up a no-till drill. But given the size of our operation and our budget constraints, it didn't seem like it was anything we were actually going to be able to afford. We just sort of thought about it um, and wished for it. And then this thing came up for sale on Craigslist for a price that should have been a big red flag. And, uh, uh, and, and, but, you know, we, against our better judgment, we went out and put the cash on the barrel head and pulled this home. And this is a Truax 8-foot no-till drill. Um, it's not really a true no-till drill by today's standards, though. It's basically a standard grain drill with uh, some special press wheels and a coulter cart out in front. Um, it has a variety of seed boxes. It's built more for DNR work and seeding road ditches, but we thought we could maybe you know, tinker with it to get it to work right for us. Um, I've developed a love-hate relationship with it because we found that it does some things pretty well and some things not well at all. The first thing I tried to do with it was go out and seed soybeans into cornstalk residue, and it didn't do a great job. Um, we learned pretty quickly that it was more worn out than we thought. Uh, the front coulters were really worn on it. It, it just didn't, it didn't get the seed in the ground very well. Um, so consequently, we had to go out and run over the field with a drag just to kind of get the seed covered up, and then it was only in the top half inch of the soil. So we needed a rain to get the soybeans to germinate. So. Like any farmer with a set of wrenches and some equipment, I went out and tore it all apart after that. And uh, we fixed a lot of problems on it. We sharpened up the front leading coulters. You know, again, not trying to spend too much money, just take it apart, sharpen it up, put it back together. Um, fixed some of the, the press wheel springs and got everything lined up really nice so that it would be as tuned up as it possibly could be. Um, and then we went home and did it again the next year, and we still weren't very happy with the results. It got the job done. We had an okay stand of beans, but it was a lot of hassle. Um, so, is that a worthless piece of equipment? No, it just can't do soybeans for us. It still does a great job for us planting cover crops after, um, in, into corn stalk residue and after soybean uh, harvest especially. Um, I've used it to seed multi-species cover crops after small grain harvest. Um, and uh, I could probably no-till alfalfa with it. I just haven't quite been brave enough to do that yet. Um, I did use it to plant oats one year, and it, I actually couldn't get the thing sped up enough to get 90 to 100 pounds of oats down. I'd have to change a sprocket out on it, but we didn't know that till planting time, so I just set it for a half rate and planted the field twice. Probably won't use it for oats again. But uh, and, and then I also kind of want to draw attention to these press wheels in the back. Uh, this is just Again, something that should probably be obvious to you guys, but that is a horrible design. <laughs> those, those things pick up mud, and then that U-shaped yoke that holds those press wheels, it stops them from turning, and next thing you know, you turn around, you've got a huge pile of residue built up, jammed up under the seed disc openers. Um, so really, it really highlights why modern drills just have a single arm holding the press wheels in the back, so the wheel can spin freely out in the open air. Um, not a lot of fun. This drill does not handle the mud at all. It's just impossible to work with in the mud. So we gave up on it for soybeans, but luckily our local soil and water office has a Great Plains 1006 NT that we can rent for a really reasonable rate. And that's how we put our beans in now. Um, and uh, we, we, that works great. Our 4020 can pull it. That's what we've done for the last three years. So I want to talk about standard drills, too. Um, sometimes you don't need a special no-till drill or even anything special to get done what you want to do um, if, it's, if it's a basic thing. So planting winter rye after soybeans. Our John Deere 8300, when we didn't have anything else, that's what we used. You can see me, I'm in the, the old 55 corn special combine there, um, getting it wrapped up, and Dad's right behind me with the, uh, with the winter rye, uh, with the 8300 drill. And this is what it looked like the next spring. Um, you know, planting green, I don't know if it qualifies because I think the rye was about this tall. 
But uh, I, I couldn't find a later picture where we terminated it later in June and the rye was you know, this tall and starting to, starting to head out. So it did a great job getting it established and especially in soybean residue where you just don't have that much to try to punch through to get the seed down on the ground. Just having something that meters it out evenly is oftentimes good enough. Um, that drill, that same drill, what I really like to use it for is interseeding. So for a long time, we felt kind of self-conscious that we were still on wide 38 inch rows. Um, but when it came time to start doing soil health practices, all of a sudden we realized we had a drill that matched the width of our planter and all we had to do was take a couple of row units off and we could use it to interseed cover crops. So this was 2019 and this was actually our first year of no-tilling and this was our first ever experience planting cover crops of any kind. We weren't sure we could get them in after corn and bean harvest, but we knew we could interseed and that's how we got started. Um, and we've come away since then. Just another picture of that. This was the next year, I believe. It was a hot day then. I was out interseeding corn. And you can see we leave four row units between the corn rows um, and then the two on each end. And when, we, when I turn around, the wheel goes back in the same place. So we're always getting four, four row units in any space in the corn. Um, that works great for interseeding. It's a little hard on the headlands turning around and running down corn. Um, but uh, other than that, it doesn't have a lot of down pressure, so getting seed in the ground is a little bit of an issue, but we just we tailor our interseed mix to be surface seeded so that if we can catch a rain, if we can time it right, we still get pretty good success. And, uh, and you can see here that that's an interseeded cover crop that did really well just with that simple setup. It doesn't always look that good. If it's dry, you know, then not so great, but we take what we can get. All right, let me catch up to myself here. Um, okay, one last thing that I want to cover, and that's talking about liquid application systems. Um, so on our farm, we're currently working on kind of an experiment. We have uh, some grant money uh, through, um, through SARE and with the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition here to work on compost and compost extract. Um, so I don't want to get too far into that because that could be a whole whole lecture on its own. But um, we are going to have a field day on our farm on August 22nd of this year to talk about this process. So if anybody's more interested, keep that in mind. It should be on the coalition's website event calendar pretty soon. Um, so I started making compost a few years ago um, and wanted to try to come up with a liquid extract that we could put on the fields with the idea being we'd make a really healthy, biologically active, biologically diverse compost and then get that into some form where we, could, where we could apply it. So I started with just making it in these small cages and then when I got to uh, you know, a whole bunch of starting ingredients, then we started windrowing it. I had too much that I couldn't mix it up in small batches like that. So we used the manure spreader and uh, threw it out on the old barn foundation here where I could handle it and turn it and stuff. And uh, we've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, and then from the compost, we use a brewer here where we put it into like a tea, basically like a big tea bag, a 300 micron mesh bag, and bubble it to oxygenate it, turn it into a liquid extract, and then try to get that out on the fields. Um, so my challenge was I needed to build some kind of a system that I could move between three pieces of equipment to try to uh, apply this stuff. And again, like I do, I turned to Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace and went out hunting for parts, and I found a box, a controller, a manifold, um, and a pump, all for like $125 in Mankato. And I figured if the pump worked, it was worth that. So I went down and snagged it. And then once I figured out that, in fact, most of the parts did work, <laughs> um, I brought everything home, and Dad and I, uh, we scrounged up some angle iron, built a stand on our planter, because we wanted to be able to put this system on along with the dry fertilizer system. and. Uh, the, the manifold was set up for 16 rows, so I just capped everything and, and uh, only ran four lines out of it. We built a reservoir out of an old 55-gallon drum and just put some bulkhead fittings in. And then around to the back of the planter, you can see, ran the rubber tubes to a nozzle body and orifice setup, and then some quarter-inch push-to-fit tubing right down on the seed, the seed tubes so that that extract is being squirted out right on top of the corn seed, right as it goes into the seed trench, and the closing wheel is covered all up. And that worked great. Um, 
it's dead simple. And you can see, uh, maybe you can see on the, we have the controller mounted right on the tractor fender, so you can see your pressure gauge and adjust with the rheostat real, real dial to get it set right and just go. So we're putting corn seed and dry fertilizer and compost extract on all in one pass. But you might remember, we rent the county drill for soybeans. So how do we get liquid extract on when we don't own the drill, the piece of equipment that needs to have the extract applicator on? Well, I got out searching for parts again, and I found some old anhydrous shanks that were made to fit a chisel plow. And since we weren't using our chisel plow anymore on our soybean residue, um, and probably never would again, it was up for grabs. So we fitted these anhydrous knives um, onto the chisel plow and then basically just transferred the rest of that same system over to that piece of equipment, mounted the controller in the cab of the 4020, and we could go out and apply compost extract uh, ahead of soybean planting. And then this way, when that drill shows up from the soil and water office, we're already done with that application. We can just plant beans. There's always somebody waiting for that drill. We can get done and get it back to them. So you can see kind of what that looks like. It does do some tillage. It's a bit of a disturbance, which bothered me a little bit at first as someone who's trying to adhere to a no-till system. But it really doesn't do that much. It's kind of deceptive because we're only going about three inches into the ground and only in that top inch or so where those shanks flare out is it really kind of stirring things up. Um, the slot is about a half inch wide and mostly it just closes right back up again. And we're putting good biology down so I kind of figure it's a good trade-off. And then the drill that I was ripping on earlier, that's got called out to do compost extract application as well. Because uh, we figured if we're doing it in the spring, let's do compost extract application in the fall with cover crops too. So I took the same liquid application system and rigged that up on our old no-till drill here so that we can do winter rye along with, uh, along with compost extract in the fall. And that's basically about everything I've got. Um, but I just kind of want to quick reiterate here the points that I was going to make today, which is, first off, you know, use your ability to observe things. Everybody's got eyeballs and a brain and know what things are supposed to look like. So you can go out and assess how your equipment's doing and then decide where you want to go from there. And uh, because you might not need to do much of anything to make stuff work well enough for what you're trying to do. Um, don't spend a lot of money on stuff unless you really find that you need to. And then make sure it's justified so that you're going to get a return back from that if you do so. Um, and then if you have questions, if you want to know about a system, you're not sure about it, contact Mark. Ask him to hook you up with a Soil Health Coalition mentor because odds are good one of us has done something that's similar to what you want to try. And you can get some information before you go out and decide that you, whether you want to commit to it or not. Um, I think that we all work better when we're learning from each other and we get to take new ideas away from stuff like this. So that's all I have for you today. 